Uh, well, I'm, I'm Lucas, I'm part of, of SAFE. Uh, for those that don't know us, maybe know us as Gnosis Safe, we're a project that was uh, founded and run by, by Gnosis for a long time and recently spun off as its own project, as its own DAO. Uh, and yeah, we're building a smart contract wallet. Uh, and I'm going to talk about account abstraction today. Uh, in my opinion, account abstraction is uh, as important, if not even more, than some of the recent Ethereum initiatives that we saw, uh, like the merge, for example. Uh, it's going to unleash a lot of innovation and it will bring a lot more usability and security to the entire space. And it is a topic that's very hot right now, especially since Bogota at DEF CON, there's a lot of talks, a lot of workshops around the counter abstraction. Uh, there was also a great panel, if you haven't seen it, uh, including Vitalik, uh, from, from Argent, and a few more. Uh, you can find it on YouTube as well. Um, but actually, it's not something new. Account abstraction is something that the Ethereum community has been working on for a long time, since like seven years. It was actually part of the initial vision of Ethereum. Uh, so the initially was uh, part of, uh, at day one to be introduced. Uh, it was descoped then at the very last minute, and since then the community tries to bring it uh, back in, in various shapes and forms. Uh, it's getting increasingly harder because uh, the Ethereum blockchain is, is getting uh, more adopted and having more fundamental changes are, are getting harder. Um, but yeah, what, what is a, a kind of abstraction? Essentially, it tries to level the playing field between two types of accounts that we currently have on the Ethereum blockchain, and that's externally owned wallets. Uh, that's like the traditional account and smart contract accounts. Um, externally owned uh, accounts is pretty much what every one of us is using if they use a MetaMask wallet, a Rainbow wallet, and any kind of, of wallet. These accounts are controlled by a private key, usually derived from, from a seed phrase, so 12 words that have to be backed up. And this private key really gives you full control over the account. You can, uh, you can manage assets with it. You can trigger transactions. You can decrypt, encrypt uh, data. Um, everything kind of bundled or uh, connected to this private key, which gives you all, all the control. Uh, the, the good thing, obviously, is that the, the, the user doesn't need any intermediaries to access their account. Just having the access to the private key is sufficient. The, the big drawback is that this then means the user has to store this private key securely, uh, write down the seed phrase somewhere and uh, store it in a, in, in a hidden place. Uh, or, yeah, uh, and that's obviously a big challenge as it means that every user has to uh, uh, kind of, uh, yeah, kind of have all these OPSEC requirements in mind and make sure that no one else gets access to a private key and also what's maybe even more critical that they don't forget where they store the private key. So this is really the reason why we have this, this problem right now on Ethereum that people just forget where, where the private key is, they, they lose it in a, in a boat accident or whatever they, uh, and on the other side they are susceptible to people uh, hacking them, hacking their computers, uh, falling for like phishing attacks and so on, because there's really this like one single point of failure, this private key, which everything depends on. Uh, and that's exactly what smart contract accounts try to solve. So the difference there is that the logic, how an account is controlled, is not part of the, uh, the core protocol. It's not this very binary logic. If you have private key, then you can do everything. If you don't have private key, you can do nothing. But instead, you can code any logic as part of the smart contract that's uh, representing your account. And uh, this just enables that we can run different programs, different uh, uh, permissions, different ways how the, the, the account is controlled, and it just uh, unleashes a lot of possibilities there uh, to have your account be optimized for the different use cases or different user groups. And account abstraction is not really inventing smart contract accounts. They've been along forever, like SAFE, uh, we, we've been building a smart contract account since, since four years. But it's really uh, leveling the playing field between those and just makes it easier for users or developers to adopt smart contract accounts and optimize for them. So one of the prime use cases that we see today with smart contract accounts is that you have 
logic as part of your account that defines that there's not just one private key controlling your account, but multiple ones, uh, also known as, as multi-sig, multi-signature wallets. And this is useful in two ways. Uh, once as, a, as an individual, that you can say you don't have your one private key and you have to really protect that uh, one private key, but you can actually have multiple keys, maybe on different devices, maybe in different computers, maybe one somewhere backed up in like a Swiss, Swiss vault or something. It really enables already a lot of uh, better OPSEC uh, yeah, features. But even more so than for the individual use case, this is super useful for, for teams or just generally people coordinating around one account together because then you can give different people their private key and they, have, uh, they can sign transactions and you can, for example, define a threshold uh, above which you can execute transactions. So, uh, yeah, it's typical that a startup has originally some, uh, some co-founders and they control an account together to manage a treasury and they have, for example, four people managing that and they always need two of those to sign. So it's pretty much like a, a joint bank account. But this is really just uh, the tip of the iceberg. You can run many different programs on a smart contract account, uh, such as spending limits that you say you have maybe one key that's on your phone, and this one allows you to have like low value transactions, like below 100 DAI or something, and you only need this key to, to do that transaction. But as soon as the transaction involves like moving more or higher value uh, assets, then you would have to collect more signatures, you have to access more of these keys, and that just enables you to combine the accessibility with a more secure setup. You can also uh, have a program that defines rules, so you might have a role that's uh, someone in your team, like a finance manager, that can propose transactions uh, to pay invoices, for example, but this person cannot actually sign the transactions. So then maybe a C-level executive has to then uh, can, can see these transactions being staged and can sign them uh, one by one, uh, having different permissions for, for different people in the team. Another use case is uh, recovery. So even though you might have already a more secure setup with multiple private keys, you can have mechanisms in place that in case you lose access to all these keys, you have some fallback mechanism, maybe social recovery. So you go maybe to a couple of friends and if they all confirm, okay, this is really uh, my, my friend wanting to recover his account, uh, then they can uh, change the keys underlying the, the account and give you back access. Um, yeah, more of a UX feature would be transaction batching. So if you today go to uh, AMM, like Uniswap, and you do a, a, yeah, an exchange there, usually this involves two user actions. Uh, one is that you give an ERC-20 approve to the contract, and the other one is that you actually execute the swap. And this means from a user perspective that you have to twice go through the entire wallet uh, signature flow. Uh, so when MetaMask pops up, you have to sign the approval and then again, you have to click a button in the interface and you have to actually sign the, the swap. And smart contract accounts just allow you to have arbitrary amounts of these actions bundled together into one transaction. Uh, so the user is only bothered once to actually verify the transaction and then sign. Uh, and this just enables a lot of UX improvements on the DAP side. Then you can have allow and deny lists. Uh, one use case there is that you have maybe an on-chain registry of malicious contracts or malicious addresses, and you want to prevent that your account at any point interacts with them, that you have, uh, yeah, that you can kind of restrict your account and make sure that there's no malicious transactions or you cannot be tricked into interacting with these addresses. Or automations, you can pretty much have like a if this then that kind of scheme in your account that for example liquidates some like make a position in, in, in some scenarios or whatever you want to define there. Just have some, some on-chain oracles define certain triggers and then you can have some, some outcomes coming from that. I'm not going through the, the risks, uh, I'm happy to chat about them afterwards, uh, but just in interest of time, maybe let's dig down on one specific uh, use case of, of account abstraction or uh, smart contract accounts and that's hybrid custody. 
So this is maybe something that's more future looking. We maybe are going to see these, these things popping up in like two to five years. But it's for me personally something that's very, very interesting and is going to be very impactful. And the problem here really goes back to this dichotomy that we have today, because all the worlds are these EOAs, these externally owned accounts. It's, and it shifted a little bit the, the format there, but I think you, you get the point. Um, so, because it's like very hard to keep, to secure this private key and uh, not to risk getting hacked, for example, uh, like self-custody is quite a niche product still. So most people, they opt for uh, the third party custodian. They say, I trust Coinbase or I, I trust uh, some other custodian to protect this private key. And then uh, I just instruct them to do certain transactions. And this is obviously not, yeah, this, this is not ideal uh, because it, it removes a lot of, of what we're building here in terms of giving control to the user, giving ownership to the user, and we introduce again these uh, permission systems or these, these middlemen, uh, which we depend upon. And uh, it's also from a regulator's perspective quite interesting because while uh, self-custody enables that you have censorship resistance, you're not dependent on any third parties. Uh, the regulator cares more about consumer protection, or at least that's their, their mandate to care about. And that's also why regulators increasingly push the, the ecosystem towards third party custodians. And that's really because it's currently this extreme between uh, self-custody and, and custodianship. And in my ideal case, you kind of combine the benefits, like the control of self-custody, but still have like the security uh, or like the, yeah, the additional safety nets from, from custodians. And that's what hybrid custody is about. So this is essentially a user having control over their account, a smart contract wallet, um, maybe for multiple private keys, and they have full control over that account, can trigger transactions however they want but they then can decide to add trusted parties and, and have some of the responsibilities be outsourced to them, like a, a bank where they can say, I can freely trigger transactions uh, under a certain threshold, but above that threshold, a bank should at least attest to this transaction, say this is a legitimate transaction, this is not someone trying to steal all my, my funds, and they have this, this part outsourced and they just have the confidence of having this, this third party uh, watch over their shoulders and, and supporting them. It can also be an insurance where the insurance says, I'm going to insure all your transactions in case a contract is getting hacked or yeah, something malicious happens, but I want to attest to the transaction first. I want to see it. I want to sign it also on, on my side. Uh, the user can always go ahead and just do whatever they please anyways, but if they want to opt in into an insurance scheme, they would have to have the, this insurance uh, attest to these transactions. Or it might be a notary, which says in case the account was uh, not active for a certain time period, and yeah, no one of us lives forever, unfortunately, uh, there can be a scheme where the, the account can be passed along to, uh, to, to the family, to the children, for example, and the notary has some, some way to take control of that account under certain requirements, uh, such as inactivity or, or something else. Um, and the, well, what's kind of nice here is the balance between having these third parties support you, but so the, the user being in control and at any point of time saying, I don't trust this, this bank anymore to, to watch over me. I'm just going to cut the cords. I'm going to switch to another provider, for example, uh, or yeah, stuff like that. And we don't end up having these lock-in uh, mechanisms which we have today where if I have this uh, bank account, like the bank has all interests to keep me there and is making it as hard as possible to, to leave. Uh, so the user is always dependent on uh, the, the banks kind of playing along. Uh, and this, this just provides like a, a nice uh, middle way between self-custody and third-party custodians. And it makes, from this dichotomy, it makes it more like a spectrum where the user can really decide where do they want to take on the responsibility themselves and where do they want to rely on someone else. And this unlocks a lot of innovation. This unlocks a lot of business opportunities also for also established 
financial institutions to say that they can now bring the value propositions of, for example, OPSEC or uh, like expertise on, uh, on like on-chain activity to the market and they can provide this as a service to the user uh, while still not being fully custodian. Yeah, that's one of the things that's possible, and this is really an, an open list. Uh, like, happy for everyone to come also after this talk to me and, and like say if they have some five minutes, good, some some more ideas what's possible with smart contract accounts. But literally every hackathon that we now have, we see more of these use cases popping up. Yeah, Safe has been building smart contract accounts since four years, and what we're building is actually not a smart wallet itself, it's more like an infrastructure for other smart wallets to be built upon. Uh, and we have 30 teams right now that build different, different ways to leverage this protocol. Is, is it for DAO treasury management? Is it for retail investors? Is it more for like the institutional side? Or also maybe DevOps team controlling other smart contracts using SAFE. And we've had quite some adoption now with uh, around $40 billion worth of, of digital assets on Ethereum mainnet alone, uh, and a, a lot more in, in NFTs and like control over valuable contracts and stuff like that, which is hard to be priced in. Uh, but it really seems like with this kind of excitement around the kind of section, SAFE becomes this, this shelling point where people are building around. And yeah, that's it. Uh, if you're excited about the account abstraction and smart contract wallets, please get in touch. Uh, we love supporting other teams building on it. Uh, so also if you have some ideas around grants or other ways that we can support, just get in touch. And yeah, that's it. Thank you.